Uh, it's an amazing thing to see God come into somebody's life and uh, turn things around in, in uh, wonderful ways. We're going to see that in the life of a Bible character today named King Nebuchadnezzar. I would invite you to turn in your Bibles with me to Daniel chapter 4. Daniel 4. If you uh, have an iPhone or an iPad, we like those here. Pull those out. Find your Bible app and turn to Daniel 4. It's in the Old Testament. And so you can go to the middle of the Bible and turn right a few pages and you'll come to Daniel. And uh, we're on the fourth week of a study of his life. If you didn't bring a Bible, there is one in the rack in front of you, and it's on page 700, 740. And you'll want to kind of follow along as we look at this. Uh, I'm, I'm always amazed how God seems to weave together the timing of certain messages. And Nebuchadnezzar and his life transformation is a great way for, help, for us to understand what baptism means and what this whole thing about God changing lives is all about. We're first introduced to Nebuchadnezzar in um, the book of Daniel in 605 B.C. So that's about 2,600 years ago. Think of that. And uh, King Nebuchadnezzar uh, meets these four Jewish young men who have been taken out of their own homeland of Israel and taken to Babylon. He's a ruthless dictator. He's in charge of the whole world at that time. And he takes these four boys out of their own hometown and brings them to Babylon, where he begins to introduce them to a little Babylonian brainwashing. And they're teaching them the language and customs of the Babylonians. They're forcing them to learn a new language. They're trying to give them a new diet. And these four young men refuse the diet and become the top shelf of the cream of the crop of these captives. Uh, Although the four young men are aspiring to leadership, they're still slaves in the Babylonian court. Well, then in chapter 2, we find that Nebuchadnezzar has a bad dream, and he can't find anyone to interpret it, and Daniel comes forward and helps him to understand that dream. And by the end of that chapter, we see Nebuchadnezzar finally realizing there is another god besides the one he worships. And it kind of stuns him. But it doesn't really change his life. Daniel 3 comes along and we find the three boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, refusing to bow down to this great statue that Nebuchadnezzar has built to have everybody bow down and worship. Those three young men refuse and they're thrown into a fiery furnace. And whereas the people who threw them into the furnace were burned up, died The three young men, all that was burned on them were the cords that held their arms. And when they came out of the furnace, the king was stunned. He'd seen the three young men along with an angel. And he's shocked. And by the end of chapter 3, we find Nebuchadnezzar very impressed with the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But still, it doesn't change his life until chapter 4. In Daniel 4 now, about 40 years has gone by. Daniel has served along faithfully with King Nebuchadnezzar. And lo and behold, Nebuchadnezzar has an event in his life that changes everything for him. He starts out talking about this change in the first three verses, which is kind of the introduction to the chapter. He says, God changed my life. And he talks about the people Uh, to whom he's addressing. Uh, He starts out in Daniel chapter 4, verse 1, King Nebuchadnezzar, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell on the earth, peace be multiplied to you. Uh, He was the leader of the world of the time, and so I'm sure that uh, he could gather a big crowd if you or I wrote to CNN or Fox News and said we had a speech to make. We shouldn't probably put out too many chairs. Not too many people would show up. But King Nebuchadnezzar spoke to all peoples and nations that they had captivated through their military exploits. And uh, it shows the, the extent of his influence. This was a powerful, wealthy, famous man at the pinnacle of his career. But something had happened to him. 
And he alludes to this in verse 2. He says, uh, it, it seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders the Most High God has done for me. And then he breaks out in this poetry, how great are his signs, that is God's signs. How mighty are God's wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. I mean, this is stunning to hear this king speak of the living God in this way. Something happened in his life. And we know that something happened in his life. If you go to the end of the chapter, the last verse of this chapter, chapter 5, or chapter 4, verse 37, he says, Now I, after telling what happened, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, for all his works are right and his ways are just, and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. So what he's saying is, God changed my life from this big-time king to now a worshiper of God. Now, I'd suggest to you that everybody in his kingdom knew that something odd had happened to the king because, as we're going to find out in a few moments, he became mentally ill. Here he was, the most powerful man in the world, and we're going to find out that his mental illness drove him out into a field where he was eating grass. And so I'm sure the talk around the town was, what in the world happened to our king? It must have been, you know, you can just hear the people talking to each other. Do you hear what happened to Nebuchadnezzar? No, what happened? Well, they, they, say, they saw him out in this field eating grass. He thought he was a cow. What? See, so now he comes back in verses 1 to 3 and he says, I'm back, and I want to tell you my story. And people are probably thinking, oh, he's back. Same old King Nebuchadnezzar. But his point is, no, I'm back, but I'm a different man. I've been changed. Things have changed for me. And I want to tell you my story. You know, something happened. It's not the same old Nebuchadnezzar. Because God had revealed himself in a powerful way to the most wealthy famous, ruthless dictator of this world and brought him to his knees. So, let's get into his experience. Verse 4 begins to tell us that God spoke to him through a nightmare. Uh, he admits in verse 4 of chapter 4 that uh, he was prospering in his kingdom. Things were looking very good to him. And he said he was at ease in his house, prospering in his palace, living what we might call the American dream. He didn't have a two-car garage and two new shiny new cars sitting in his garage. He had probably a stall with 50 chariots and 100 horses. Who knows? But he was living in the lap of luxury at the top of his game, the head honcho, numero uno. But something happened. He had a dream. And it was so disturbing that again he called his staff. It's interesting in verses 4 to 7 we see him calling his staff, his astrologers, his, uh, you know, all these wizards and stuff. Why didn't he go immediately to Daniel? And it makes you wonder if part of it was he remembered the last dream in chapter 2 and that Daniel's dream interpretation wasn't in his favor because Daniel said you will be usurped by another kingdom. And so maybe he waited, we don't know. But finally, he shared his dream with Daniel in verses 8 through 18. And he describes this dream. He said, I had a dream, and there's this big tree, and this tree is bearing fruit, and the birds are roosting in it. And then he, he says something odd happened. These watchers came, these heavenly beings, and they cut down the tree. And all that was left was a stump and then there's this thing about grazing in the field and the seven, the seven periods of time, and I, I just don't understand it. Can you help me understand it? Isn't it interesting how somebody who could meet Daniel and those three young men and then he ha have a dream interpreted for him in chapter 2 and then witness God's mighty power in delivering these boys from the furnace in chapter 3 still doesn't get it. He doesn't have true faith 
He knows there's another deity in his world, but he's not a follower. And, and you know, that, that happens to people. Look, there are churches filled with people like King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, they think they have true faith, but they don't. Maybe they've been inspired by God in some way, and, and because of that, they say, it's my intention to be a better person. I, I just want to be a better person. And they have good intentions. But, you know, it's no different than somebody signing up for a gym membership, paying for a year at the gym, and then never going to the gym. Good intentions don't translate into true faith. So many people have good intentions. Jesus talked about this in Matthew 21. He said there are two boys. The dad said to the boys, I want you to do something for me. One son said, no, I don't want to. And the other son said, okay, dad, I'll do it. And then the dad went away, and the son who said he did it didn't do it. He shucked it off. And the boy who said he wouldn't do it went ahead and followed through with his dad. And guess which person Jesus commended? So many people sit in churches with good intentions. I, I want to be a better person. And that is not true faith. We also see that a lot of times people think that high moral standards is what it means to be a Christian. They sit in churches, they say, I want to be a person of high moral standing. But you know, you can have high moral standings and not have true faith. I mean, look at the religions of the world. All the religions of the world stress moral values. You can be Jewish or Buddhist or Islamic or even a member of a cult and have high moral standards but not be a true believer in God. Uh, you can grow up in a good family. So many people grow up in good families and have these moral values instilled in them. But it's not true faith. I've met some really good people in Rotary Club and Kiwanis Clubs. But they're not true believers. Just because you have high moral standards does not mean you have true faith. And then churches are filled with people who may have a fast start, and it's better to have a fast start than no start, but they're kind of inspired by a sermon or by a baptism video where somebody shares their faith, they're inspired by it, you know. And they have a fast start and they think they're going to be a follower. And then, in fact, we've had people, they've shared their story on a baptism video and then a couple months later we don't see them. They kind of start well and then they're gone. And, of course, Jesus was clear he used an agricultural illustration to talk about this phenomenon. He said a sower went out, and he's speaking of God sowing through the Word of God, and it said it falls on different kinds of soils. Sometimes it falls on a hard path, and he's spiritually speaking, it falls on somebody's heart, and, and then taken away right away by the evil one, it never takes root. And he talked about a second kind of soil where... It's kind of rocky, and it, it begins to grow, and then uh, the sun bakes down. And he says a lot of people are like that. They have a fast start, and they start to grow, and then suffering comes, and then they just kind of fall away. And then he said there's a third kind of soil that's sown into ro to a soil that's got thorns and thistles, and it grows up, it starts well, and it's then the, the worries and cares and money and sex and distractions come and pretty soon it's gone. And then he said there's a fourth soil and he's speaking of the soil of a human heart and a person takes it in and transforms their life and their life begins to bear fruit. You know, I grew up in farming country and I know my relatives who were farmers would not like it if the seed they planted didn't bear fruit. They would be really upset, because that's the point of sowing seed. And that was Jesus' point. So many people sitting in churches have a fast start. And then when the trials of life come, they just kind of, they're not there. It's not a true faith. Now this is so important 
and actually urgent because every one of us will stand in judgment someday of the living God. And Jesus was pretty clear in Matthew 7, 21, when he said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. This is more than good intentions. It's more than having a high moral standard. It's more than a fast start because of this initial feeling of inspiration. What Jesus is talking about is a person who bows before the King of kings and Lord of lords and has a life transformed by God and then begins to live out that life under the Father's will. Nebuchadnezzar is a good example of someone who did not have true faith. And you know, it's a question for us. Do we have true faith? Now, the encouraging thing is, God did not give up on Nebuchadnezzar just because he didn't get it. It says in verses 19 to 27 that God sent a witness named Daniel to confront Nebuchadnezzar's pride. The root issue with which Nebuchadnezzar wrestled was pride, thinking more of himself than he should have. It says in verse 19 that when Daniel heard the dream, he was dismayed and alarmed because he could see immediately that this dream referred to the king personally. And he was upset by it. And as you read through the story, you see that King Nebuchadnezzar had to encourage Daniel. He says, okay, Daniel, tell me what it means. And so Daniel interprets the dream, beginning in verse 20, verse 27. And he describes the tree, and he says, It's you, O king. You're at the top of your game. You've got money. You've got wealth. You've got fame. You've got power. But you're the tree. And you're going to be cut down. Verse 25, You shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox. You will be wet with the dew of heaven, and seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom He will. And as it was commanded to leave the stump and roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be confirmed for you from the time that you know that heaven rules. You know what Daniel said comes up three times in this passage. This whole phrase, the most high rules over the kingdoms of men and gives it, gives it to whoever he wishes. You see it in verse 17. You see it in verse 25, verse 26, and verse 32. If something is said once, you say, oh, it must be important. If it's said twice, you think, oh, he must be emphasizing it. If it's said three times, you think, oh, this is really important. If it's said four times, it means this is the point. King Nebuchadnezzar, here's the point. Your life on earth will be much better if you acknowledge there's a God who rules the heavens. Must have been hard for Daniel to deliver that message to a person who could have had his head chopped off. After all, Daniel was still a slave. But I think we can learn something from Daniel. Daniel was not a professional. Daniel didn't go to seminary. He didn't have a graduate degree in Bible. He'd grown up in a home with parents that loved God, but he was not a professional. But he did have this. He had the spirit of the living God in him. Even Nebuchadnezzar noticed that. And he knew his Bible. He knew what God was saying. So often we think we can't help anybody. But God often calls us even to talk to the rich and famous and influential. Not because we're professionals. It's not the clergy that have the biggest impact. It's people like you and me who just are common, ordinary people who have the Spirit of God and the Word of God. You don't have to be a professional to have an impact. 
Every story you hear this morning had a Daniel who came forward to talk to them about Jesus. The other thing you notice about Daniel was that he cared about the king. He was alarmed. He wished that the dream was about the king's enemies, not about the king. He cared about the king. He listened to the king. For 40 years, he'd served alongside of the king. And even though the king was the most ruthless of dictators, Daniel developed a love for him. He cared about him. See, we can learn from that. And third, Daniel courageously called him to repent, to change his way of life, to repent of his sin and to surrender to God. You see that in verse 27, don't we? Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. He's saying, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, you have a problem with pride and you are a ruthless dictator and you're not practicing righteousness. You're harming people. You're oppressing people. You're killing people. You need to give those things up and humble yourself before God. And that was courageous, wasn't it? Not a professional. He cared about the king. And because he cared, he told him the truth. So if we care about our friends, we tell them the truth. We don't let our desire to be liked get in the way. If we know Christ, we want to tell family and friends about him. I think there's a couple of applications for us. We need to tell the truth. Proverbs 8, 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. And we're called to tell people that truth, that their way of life and the way they're headed and their pridefully wanting to be the God of their own making will lead them right into the pit. They're headed to destruction. Jesus came along in Mark 1.15 and said, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel, the good news. It's urgent. It's urgent today. If you're not yet a Christian, this is an urgent message for you to hear. Pride leads to destruction. Today is the day to repent. You'll find out why in a moment. But this message needs to come from a heart of love. We need to care for people. It's amazing to me as I see Jesus telling the truth in love. In Luke 19, 41 and 42, it says that he, as he got ready to walk into Jerusalem to die on the cross, he wept. Why did he weep? Because he saw the city and the people in the city, and he said, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. His heart was breaking for the people of Jerusalem who were rejecting it. The Apostle Paul in Romans 10 verse 1 said, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. If we know Christ and we care about our friends, we beg them to consider their way of life, to repent of their sins and trust in Jesus and be transformed. And you say, what happens if we try that and the person we love ignores it? Well, what happened to Nebuchadnezzar when he ignored Daniel's advice? We find the story going on in verse 28 to 37. We could summarize it by saying, God humbled me, and now I praise him. God humbled him. In verse 28, here's Nebuchadnezzar on the roof of his house. And I want you to take note here, the Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar had gone on a year before this happened. You say, why did it take a year before God did something? God, in His grace, gave him another year to change his way of life. And maybe he tried. Maybe he tried to be a good moral person. He, maybe he thought, I'm, I'm going to kill ten less people today than I killed yesterday. Who knows? But a year went by, and God didn't come through with that judgment. And so 
he remembered Daniel said perhaps, this divine perhaps, so maybe he presumed that God wouldn't do anything. But sure enough, verses 28 to 30, as he's standing on the roof of his garden, his palace, looking out over the beautiful city of Babylon, says in verse 29, at the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. And and the king said, we don't know if he said to himself or to somebody else, is this not great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? Look what I did. I built this palace. I mean, the palace was huge. And then we know from archaeology in Iraq, you can actually go and see this, 2,000 square acres of land, and surrounded by this huge wall that was so wide you could have chariot races on top. It had one, this city had one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the hanging gardens that the King Nebuchadnezzar built for his wife. Look, oh, look what I've done. We're so susceptible to this, aren't we? As humans, we look in the mirror and go, look what I've done. It gets pretty convicting. King Nebuchadnezzar was all about his own glory. And that's when God spoke into his life. At that very moment, something happened. While he was still speaking, heaven's voice rang out. His kingdom was lost. He became an ox. He thought he was a cow. And in verses 31 to 33, it says he went out and walked around on his hands and his fingernails grew long, his hair grew long. Some people have said, well, this must be a fairy tale. But there is a psychological, psychiatric term for this, bianthropy. And people talk about this as a paranoia a mental illness where somebody thinks they're an animal. It's like the guy who just felt like he was a dog, went to the counselor, and the counselor asked him, what's his problem? He said, well, I just think I'm a dog. And the counselor said, well, sit down on the couch. And the guy said, I'm not allowed on the couch. And we kind of chuckle about it. But in Nebuchadnezzar's case, it was true. He had a mental break. And it was because he presumed that he was okay. But in his pride, God humbled him. Despite the dream in chapter 2 and the furnace in chapter 3 and Daniel's instruction and warning, the one who was a beast to others became a beast. The man who was the superman became subhuman. This is what sin will do to us. This is what pride will do. This is what happens to us when we decide to ignore God. But something happened. Despite the suffering, God was working. And now it says in verse 34, Daniel praised God. Verse 34, at the end of the days... So we don't know how long the seven seasons. Some people think it's seven seasons. Some people think it's seven years. We're not sure. But after this period of time, Nebuchadnezzar says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven. See, that was God at work. God brought him to this humbling and to such a point like the prodigal son finally had nowhere else to turn. He lifted his eyes to heaven. It's a moment of divine insight. It's a work of the Holy Spirit of God opening his eyes. And reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him forever for his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. Nebuchadnezzar was changed by God, humbled and now praising. And in verse 35, he calls on all the inhabitants of the earth to do his will because he says none can stay his hand or say to him what have you done he finally gets it in verse 36 we find that God restored the throne to Nebuchadnezzar 
He said, His reason returned to Him, and the glory of His kingdom and majesty of His splendor returned to me. My counselors and the Lord sought me, and I was established in my kingdom, and still more greatness came to me. I think there's a lesson here that when we on earth acknowledge there is a ruler in heaven, God opens up for us not only our personal salvation and cleansing and and healing, but He restores us. There are benefits that come to humbling ourselves before God. First of all, we see that God exists and He's powerful and alive in our lives. And then we see Him deliver us from guilt and we can let go of the suitcase of shame because we know it's been nailed to the cross. There are benefits that come when the human heart is converted by the grace of God. And God does it. It comes to us as a gift. It's the true miracle of life. Somebody's life has changed forever. And so Daniel says in verse 37, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, for all his works are right, and his ways are just, and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. And he says, I'm a poster boy for God's humbling and exaltation. Now you've been hearing these stories, and the stories you're hearing are descriptions of the same thing that happened to Nebuchadnezzar. And I'd like to ask the, I think we have two that will be baptized. So uh, Sophia and uh, Marianne, maybe you want to go get ready. Uh, We'll have you go back there and get ready for your baptism here. And uh, while they're getting ready, let me just say a couple of things in conclusion. You see, things are better for us on earth when we acknowledge that God rules from the heavens. So the question for us, I think there's some applicational questions. Have you ever repented of your sins and trusted in Jesus alone? You know, you may have been coming to the church, you're kind of mildly curious about spiritual things. But if you ever come to that time in your life where you say, you know, I I need to make a 180 degree change. I need to give up my way of thinking, my way of living, my old practices, the things I cope with to get through life, and my own pride, and I need to release it, and I need to see Jesus died and rose again. Let me just say to you, if you've not yet received Christ as your Savior, you don't have forever to do this. In God's grace, he gave Nebuchadnezzar one year. We're not assured we'll have one more day. And I think that God may be calling some of us today, even before we leave this place, to right where we're seated, to say, God, I am, I am sorry for the way I've been living. Forgive me. Come into my life and change me. I repent of my sins and trust in you. Secondly, I want to ask you, are you a witness of the Lord Jesus? Do you care about your friends? If so, then pray for them. Pray that they would have a Nebuchadnezzar moment where they would get so frustrated with life. I mean, this this is a good word for parents. Sometimes we need to pray that there would be a humbling so that they could look up and see Christ. Are you praying, caring, and sharing the gospel? Or are you too worried about what people think of you? And that's something we all wrestle with, but we got to get past it because if we really love people, we want to tell them the truth in loving ways. And third, will you please pray for our baptism candidates? Pray that they would not be one of the first three soils, but they would be the fourth soil, that God would truly be working in them so they could bear fruit And these two young women live the rest of their lives for the glory of Jesus Christ. Would you pray that? Would you please pray that? Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the story of Nebuchadnezzar. And Lord, I know that we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and we need to be humbling ourselves before you. And I pray that even as we witness these baptisms with Mary Ann and Sophia, that your Holy Spirit would cause somebody to repent of their sins and trust in you.
and that others of us might become more courageous in our witness. In Jesus' name, amen. Twenty-six hundred years later, people are still being changed by God. Isn't that amazing? God is so good, powerful, majestic, and mighty. And I can guarantee you that your life on earth will not make sense until you recognize that God rules from the heavens. Today is the day to trust in Him, to begin to follow Him, to be transformed by Him, and to walk in the newness of life. May the Lord bless you and keep you, make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you His peace. Please take three minutes, find somebody you don't know, introduce yourself, share stories, and maybe find one of these baptism candidates and just thank them for their story, their courage, coming forward to get wet in front of us to show their alignment to Jesus. What a wonderful thing. What a privilege we have as a church to witness the power of our God today. Thank you for coming. You're dismissed.